welcome back to the channel, Airbus, what's it doing now? Today, I'd like to cover CPC 1 plus 2 fault. Um, I've delivered this in the simulator recently in a, on a couple of uh, occasions and also sandbagged uh, in the sim uh, on a detail as well. And it's a really uh, useful exercise uh, to cover and covers uh, many of the uh, core competencies. But uh, I think sometimes the, the knowledge on the system uh, is a little bit grey and I think it's really important that we have a, a, a firm understanding of what we're doing when we're uh, intervening with the pressurisation system. I cover this in a fair bit of detail in the pressurisation briefing that I gave and if you haven't watched it already I'll put a link up top here uh, for you to go back over and, uh, and review the CPCs, what their job is and how the uh, pressure controllers then manage a profile of pressurisation uh, during a uh, particular flight. So what we're dealing with here is in the event of both of those failing, how we interact with the system and what we're trying to achieve. So I'll start with an overview of the system uh, and the controls, and then I'll look at the effects of our intervention and what we're trying to achieve and how we go about doing it and hopefully give you some sort of mental model of uh, what's actually going on with the aircraft to help you uh, improve the outcome uh, of, uh, of the event. So um, typically when we're flying along uh, in our cruise we're at 37, 38, 39,000 feet. That's the aircraft altitude. And the cabin is typically around 8,000 feet at those altitudes. And that gives our passengers a nice, comfortable, breathable, uh, air-conditioned uh, atmosphere. The difference between the aircraft altitude and the cabin altitude is the delta difference. OK, we, we'll come on to how we see that on our uh, cruise page and on our pressurization, pressurization page uh, in a few moments time. But that's essentially what we're managing. We're managing the difference between what the, the cabin is at in terms of its internal uh, pressurization to what the aircraft is actually at. And that positive differential there is the aircraft is designed uh, to maintain. It's very good at maintaining a positive uh, differential. It's not very good at maintaining a negative. And so to give you some idea of the limitations, um, depending if you're an automatic or a manual, somewhere between sort of 8.2, 8.6, all the way up to 8.9 is the maximum positive differential. And in the negative differential case, it's minus one. So obviously the aircraft doesn't like negative differential. We've got some protections to help us with that, but I'll come on to that a little bit later on. But suffice to say, positive diff is good. And I would say, for the most part, as long as the aircraft was above the cabin, uh, you're going to be OK. And certainly at these sort of altitudes. Uh, but in any case, as long as the aircraft is above the cabin, you've got some form of positive differential and it doesn't exceed those limits. Uh, then that's uh, a good place. If the aircraft is below the cabin, because you've got less fat there at only minus one diff, then we're in a more uh, tricky situation. So the aim really is to keep the aircraft above the cabin. Good. So that's the differential, uh, uh, what we're concerned about in terms of limitation. Um, we have on the overhead panel a number of, uh, or a, a, a selection on the uh, CPC uh, pressurization page, or the pressurization page I should say, we've got a number of indications to help us understand what the aircraft is doing. So you'll remember on the overhead panel on the pressurization, I'll see if I can bring a picture up for you in a minute because my drawings are never that fantastic. Uh, we've got the option of the automatic and the manual and we've got vertical speed selection as well. So we pull it up towards us or push it uh, away from us in order to control that vertical speed. Um, on the uh, uh, pressurization page, you've got the differential. Uh, so that's what we were talked about here. We've got the cabin VS in positive and uh, negative sense. Uh, we've got the cabin altitude, and we also have the position of the outflow valve. So essentially what we're doing here is the packs are, are operating and they're pumping air into the cabin. And all we're really doing here with these, with this uh, selector or all the, all the cabin pressure controllers are doing is opening and closing the outflow valve or um, varying the, the opening of the aperture of the, uh, I don't think it's ever closed, but uh, varying the aperture of the outflow valve uh, in order to meet the target. 
And that's essentially what we're going to be doing when we when we manually control the aircraft. Good. Hopefully that uh, explains the, the system into a basic overview. So what happens then when they fail? Well, when CPC 1 plus 2 fail, you'll remember that the outflow valve has three motors. One for CPC 1, another for CPC 2, and of course, another motor for our manual operation. The manual operation of the outflow valve takes a little bit of time. So when you're making any selections there, just give it a blip and then wait to see the result. Don't stare at the outflow valve. Just have a look at the vertical speed. Give it a two or three seconds and wait for the result. And if you need to make any changes, make it from them. So that's really what we're trying to do here now. We're just trying to do the job of the uh, pressure controllers manually, but we need to be very careful about it because the outflow valve isn't very responsive and that switch selection takes a little while for it to actually register what um, the result. So just a review then of what these switches do in terms of the effect on the cabin pressure. And um, this switch uh, in particular, and this is the, the area that causes a, sometimes a little bit of confusion. So like we said, the outflow valve is almost always going to be slightly open. What we're doing with the VS is just controlling how, how open that is, if that makes sense. So if we were to make the selection upwards, VS up, what you're doing is you're opening that valve a little bit more. If you open the valve a little bit more, then more of the air is coming out of the cabin. So we're going to be climbing the cabin. So making the selection up, increasing the VS. What that's going to do is it's going to reduce the differential. We're climbing the cabin. So VS increase climbs the cabin. So of course it reduces that differential. You'll notice the vertical speed is going to increase and you'll notice that the cabin altitude is going to increase. And you'll notice if you did look at the uh, outflow valve that will also open slightly as well. So I think that makes sense. VS increase, Differential reduces, vertical speed increases, cabin altitude increases, and the valve opens slightly. The converse of that, of course, is if we push forward, VS reduce minus the vertical speed, then of course what's going to happen now is that the cabin is going to descend. You're going to now increase the differential. The vertical speed is going to reduce, the cabin altitude is going to reduce, the flap is going to, uh, to close slightly and the cabin is going to descend. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that puts a little bit of uh, meat on the bone as to what's actually going on. So just to recap, if we open the VS, we're going to open the hole and the cabin is going to climb. If we reduce the VS, then we're going to, uh, we're going to lower the cabin or reduce the altitude of the cabin the differential is going to increase and the valve is going to close slightly. That's basically it. How we actually manage to control it now is just as important. So, so if the uh, CPCs fail, say in the crude, in this case at 38,000 feet, then the valve is going to freeze in the position where it last was, where the, where the controllers were uh, controlling the cabin, either a, a, a climb or a slight descent in order to maintain its schedule uh, for the cabin. Now, if it's frozen there, then the outflow valve needs controlling, obviously, by ourselves. If it's frozen with the air, with the uh, cabin climbing slightly in order to maintain its schedule, then that's where it will stay. So we need to keep an eye on this. It's not an immediate rush or an immediate drama when this happens, but we need to see what the cabin is doing. So say, for example, that it was um, commanding a slight cabin increase and a vertical speed plus of, say, two or three hundred feet a minute at that stage, then obviously the cabin is going to continue to climb. Now, the differential is not going to be a problem for us. But of course, if a cabin climbs too much, then we're going to have a situation where we're going to start getting some ECAN, ECAN warnings about the cabin altitude. So we do need to uh, understand and see what's going on at that point. Conversely, of course, if it was actually reducing the cabin altitude at two or three hundred feet a minute, then the differential is going to be a problem. And of course, then what's going to happen is we're going to probably pop one of the uh, safety valves on the rear bulkhead. Uh, so that we don't exceed the pressurization limits uh, of the aircraft. Not the end of the world because that's their design and as soon as you bring the cabin within limits the safety valve will, will close again so no major drama.
As long as we've got control of the cabin at this point, then we can stay in this condition you know, for as long as we want. Now, obviously, you're going to think about maybe diverting. It's not something that maybe you want to continue all the way towards Hagada uh, for having just left Gatwick, for example. So and, and, and CPC failures you can't dispatch with. So this is all going to be part of your uh, diagnosis and your DODAR and your obviously your decision making process. But the key thing here is is not to panic. It's it's a very, very manageable situation. You're in there in the cruise, the cabin is happy at 8,000 feet. You've got control of the cabin at this point by, by having uh, no vertical speed and cabin not climbing and descending. Happy days. This is all the cabin controllers would do if they were in auto. But of course, it's going to take some managing, particularly when we start our descent. So if we start a descent, of course, again, that's, this, is, this isn't going to provide us with any real drama. The aircraft's going to descend and the, the differential is going to reduce. And we've already said, as long as the aircraft is above the cabin altitude, then we're in good shape. We've got good positive differential. And of course, as we descend the aircraft, then that differential is going to reduce. Happy days. Now, when you get this failure on the SD page, it'll give you some guidance as to what the uh, aircraft altitude should be versus the um, cabin altitude. And the recommendation from memory in the descent is about 300 uh, feet per minute in the descent. So one thing I will note, and it was a good tip that was given to me, was that this information here is merely a guide. Remember, as long as you've got the aircraft above the cabin, you're going to be in good shape. Don't worry too much about this and spend too much time getting these absolutely precise. And here's, here, here's another tip. The recommendation here is that anything below 200, flight level 200, is to have the cabin at zero. My recommendation to you, as it was given to me, and I thought, and I think works really, really well, is to actually get the cabin at the platform altitude of your approach. You don't really want it, I would say, at zero when you're making an approach to a platform altitude of 3,000 feet, because the the procedure requires you during the approach to open the outflow valve fully up and to essentially depressurize the airplane. Well, if you jump it from sea level to three or 4,000 feet, or God forbid at Geneva at 7,000 feet, uh, that's going to have uh, 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 a kind of comfortable feeling with the passengers and maybe one or two ears might, might pop if it happens that dramatically. So the recommendation was given to me, and, and, and I think it's a great idea, is uh, have the cabin at your platform altitude, say 3,000 feet, if that's what it is for your uh, intended approach. And here's the thing, and here's the, here's the reason why it works uh, really well. At 38,000 feet, if you descend, and you have to check my maths on this, but it's there or thereabouts, if you descend at, say, 2,000 feet a minute from 38,000 feet down to 3,000 feet, it's going to take you in the uh, region of 19, 20 minutes. If you descend the, air, the cabin from 8,000 feet down to about 3,000 feet at 300 feet a minute, it's going to take you in around 19, 20 minutes. So that takes the pressure off. The aircraft's always going to be above the cabin. You can come back together as a crew. You're not kind of, um, uh, the, 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 the pilot monitoring now isn't, isn't busy trying to manage this uh, vertical speed in order to meet this target and taking his attention away from, from monitoring the pilot flying. I wouldn't say you can leave it alone, uh, and I'll come on to why that is in a minute, but largely big picture stuff here. The aircraft is descending, the cabin is descending, and if it's done reasonably well, the two should almost coincide, or certainly the workload's gonna reduce um, quite significantly if you take this uh, big picture approach. So I said um, earlier on, uh, just a second ago, that it, it will take a little bit of, of management because what happens is if you set a, a descent of 300 uh, feet a minute at 38,000 feet, then the outflow valve is gonna be at a certain position. Now, that 300 feet that you set up here isn't going to be maintained all the way down the approach or all the way through the descent. And the reason for that is the air starts to become thicker. And so the effect of that uh, outflow valve in that set position is going to vary that rate of climb and rate of descent simply because of the density of the air. So to give you an example, if you set that 300 foot a minute rate of descent for the cabin at 38,000 feet, 
By the time you got down to about 20,000 feet, that vertical speed will probably be somewhere in the region of six or 700 feet a minute, um, as an example. So you are going to need to reduce that a little bit as you come down on the descent. But, you know, it's 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 a much easier thing to manage. Set it at 300 and then periodically come back to it and then just check. Trying to maintain around 300 uh, feet a minute. Once you then get to your platform altitude, the cabin will be about two or three thousand feet, whatever you've decided to set for your platform. The aircraft will be at two or three thousand feet. When you open the uh, outflow valve, you're not going to have any major pressure differential. Much more comfortable uh, for everybody, and I th and I think you'll agree a much easier way to manage uh, the CPC one and two failure. Good. Hopefully that uh, adds some uh, meat to the bone for you and kind of explains uh, a simplified way of dealing with it, certainly for workload, an easier way uh, to manage. The key things to remember is to not to panic. Get control of the cabin to make sure that it's not climbing or descending. If you're in the cruise and it's where you want it to be, start a descent at some point. Start at 300 feet a minute and uh, try and have your cabin altitude at your uh, your approach platform altitude. Start off at 300 feet a minute. Keep an eye on it on the way down and hopefully the two should very closely uh, come together. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, keep the plates spinning and I'll look forward to seeing you again very soon.